Hi, I'm Brian Schroff from Beyondware. Welcome to part three of the video tutorial series for Beyond Typicals 2. In this video, I'll show you how to build your section. I'll give you a tour of the over 100 sections in Beyond Typicals, show you how to place them and make simple edits to meet your needs for your visualization project. Let's get started. So we'll start this tutorial in a blank model. The first thing I'll do is open our sections palette here with this top button of our toolbar on the right. You'll see just by scrolling through, we have a large variety of preset sections for a roadway or a bridge for our pro users. You'll see we have a number of vehicular types of sections. We have some rail, we have vegetation and buildings, curbs and gutter, some water features, trenching, cut and fill slopes retaining walls and right-of-way lines. So a lot of different features here that uh, we can get into later. Since there are so many, we do include this uh, filter button list at the top. So you'll see we can tag some of our sections to appear under these filters. So if you're looking for a specific gutter, we can filter out a lot of the clutter by clicking on these buttons. If you want to get back to that full list, you can click the clear tag. You can also search for a certain type of section. So for instance, if I wanted to go find those gutters, I can type that in here. We can also clear that by pressing that same button. To place a section, it's as simple as left clicking on the element in the section palette that you want, moving your mouse into the model and left clicking to place again. So you can see I can very quickly pull several sections into our model and start building out a typical section. So I've got three common lanes. Let's pull in a shoulder, a gutter, a curb, a raised median, maybe some sidewalk. So now very quickly we're starting to build our section. We can move our sections in the model by clicking and dragging on that section. So if I click and hold my left mouse button for one second, you'll see I get a little timer and then I can, I'm free to move my mouse left and right and left click to place that section again. We also have a section hierarchy list in our toolbar. This is a functional list of all your elements in your model arranged from top to bottom as they appear left to right. So you'll see I've got that raised median right here between the curb and the sidewalk. If I were to move that median to the right, you'll see as I'm hovering in the model, it's moving in the hierarchy. And if I left click to place again, you'll see I move that median to the bottom of the list. You can also move these sections within the hierarchy. You can click and hold on a section and drag it around the list. You'll see when I'm able to place it between a section, it will give me that green check mark. So if I wanna place this between the curb and sidewalk, I can let go. You can also group things in the hierarchy to move them together. So for instance, if I use my quick action wrap with folder, I've now placed my raised median in a folder and I can move my sidewalk into that folder by clicking and dragging. So you'll see they're both listed under this new folder that's created. And now I'm free to move all of these elements together by clicking and dragging that new folder in the hierarchy and I can move those elements at the same time. A couple of last tips for the section hierarchy. First is the ability to link your stripes with the lane or section element next to it. So you'll see that this stripe here is linked to this common lane. You can see if I click that link, it toggles it off. I can click it again to toggle that link back on. It's also indicated by this yellow stripe between those two elements. So what that's showing me is this leftmost stripe is linked to this common lane. So any changes I make to that common lane, whether it's height or location within the section, that stripe's going to come with it. So if I pull this lane up, I'll show you that that white stripe is still showing up on the elevation of that raised lane. And because this stripe down below it is not linked to that common lane, it stays down with the section, this common lane section that it's linked to. I can go ahead and pull that stripe back up 
by clicking on the link to have it linked to this section over here. And should I move this section over, those stripes will come with it because they carry that link to that section. Lastly, starting in a clean model, I want to show you, you can rename your lanes and elements in the section hierarchy in addition to the section label override, as well as the basic lane editor. And for any of these elements, I can double click the name of that in the hierarchy and change the name and press enter and you'll see the through lane was updated. You also note that any of these sections that have been changed from their original item uh, show in parentheses the name of that original element that we brought in from our section palette. We can also change the name of folders. These won't update any of the elements, but it's helpful for organization. You can also rename your striping should you choose to. Beyond Typicals offers a lot of customization for your sections. So you'll see here I'm in the default project that you get when you load up uh, Beyond Typicals, which is our two-way left turn lane example project. When I click on a section, you'll see this dialog box comes up here on the left. This offers all the different menus of editing uh, and customizing your section. These vary depending on what kind of section you've chosen. So you can see for our common lane, we have this traffic menu where a grass section would not. I'll show you some of the basic editing capabilities here. So I can first change the section name. So I can go ahead and call this a through lane. I can edit the width of this lane by typing it in or uh, using the spin bar. I can change the height of a lane. So if I want that to raise an elevation, say maybe I have some retaining walls in my section or some cut and fill slopes, I can adjust those up and down. You'll see these sections also have primary and secondary assets. For our travel lanes, generally our primary asset is moving traffic, uh, but something like our trees section, we have uh, some repeating trees and 3D grass, this grass fescue. And then for our common lanes, we also have some marking abilities. You'll see this on our two-way left turn lane where we have a two-way left turn marking. We also allow some customization of that spacing. So for something like a two-way left turn lane, we could see that marking uh, get closer together by dragging that spin bar. We also have some crosswalk markings, turn arrows, and words on pavement. For these repeating primary and secondary assets that are in some of our sections, you'll see this menu also allows for some customization for how those appear. So you'll see I'm adjusting the spacing of these trees. I can adjust the internal horizontal offset. So a zero pushes it to the left side of the section and a one to the right. I can also uncheck this uniform box if I wanna add some randomization to the horizontal offset of those repeating elements. I can also adjust the external horizontal offset here in case I need to push those outside the limits of that section. We have a longitudinal offset to go forward or backward and a vertical offset to go up or down. We can also adjust the rotation of these so we can adjust in the X or Y or Z direction. And we can also scale these elements. You can see when this link is toggled on, I can scale these proportionally and if I uncheck that link, I can scale in just the X, Y, or Z direction. We also have the ability to enable some randomization to these elements. So if you want to see uh, maybe some trees that are differential in size, we can go ahead and add a scale factor, minimum and maximum. We can also have this rotation minimum and maximum. So I can bump those up and bring the total scale down a little bit since it adds a bit of scale to those elements. And then down here at the bottom, I can click re-randomize and you'll see I'm getting a random selection of uh, sizes of trees there. This re-randomize button is also really helpful for something like a parking lane in case you want to see the selection of cars uh, randomized as well. In our traffic menu, uh, we have some 
basic traffic edits and advanced traffic settings in here, but I'll show you some of the basic ones. We can pause traffic with this checkbox. We can also globally pause traffic with this button in the bottom right, but if you wanted to pause per section, we have that ability here. We have the ability to use our global traffic settings. So when this is toggled on, if I show you our global traffic settings in the menu, we have a traffic library. We can adjust globally the types of vehicles coming through the lanes. So I can use our settings to turn off this luxury vehicle. And for those lanes with global traffic turned on, you'll see that luxury vehicle turned off because it's deferring to the global settings. For our travel lanes, we can adjust the speed with this spin bar. You can see we can get, get them moving pretty fast or we can type in a specific speed. can also adjust the volume of a travel lane. So if you want to see more cars moving down the lane, we can bump that up to, uh, on a scale of 1 to 100. This is more effective when we change the length of the segment, which I'll show you. Where if that volume is set to 1, you would see just one vehicle moving down the section at a time. Whereas when we bump that volume up, we'll get uh, several more vehicles. We can turn that slider down to zero to stop traffic from coming down the lane, or we can go to our basic menu and turn the primary asset to none. We can adjust the direction of traffic, so we can toggle forward or back. This also works by flipping the section or pressing F on your keyboard. You can add a stop bar to your segment by toggling this on. What that'll do is create a stopping location in your segment where vehicles will temporarily come to a stop. This is a new feature to Beyond Typicals 2.1 uh, that has some advanced settings that we can cover later, but this is a great feature for showing something like a bus stopping at a bus station. Finally, wrapping up the traffic settings, if you turn off global traffic settings, this menu here will show you all the traffic that is activated for that lane, which you can adjust on a lane by lane basis. So for instance, if we don't wanna see scooters or sport bikes or semi trucks or other trucks, we can turn those off here. We also have an ability to add uh, pipes beneath the pavement. So under our underground menu, we can turn on the toggle on the pipe. You'll see by default, it's this small two inch pipe, but we have a pull down selection, so we can make that larger. You can see we do a 48 inch pipe up to 60 inch. We have some metric as well. You can see if this pipe is extending out beyond the subgrade, you can always raise your height of your section up. You can move that pipe, so we can move it to the left or right, up or down in the section. Um, we can also, if we want to, push it externally using the external position uh, setting. We have a longitudinal offset if you want to move that pipe forward or backward. We can also show a rotation on that pipe. We can also scale the pipe if you need it larger in any direction than the options that we give you here. If you wanted to make that elliptical, you could untoggle this uh, linked scale and scale everything in just one direction or the other. You can also adjust the length of the pipe. If you wanted to extend this one further out, we have a spin bar for that as well. You can see we can adjust the watercolor of the pipe right here. So we have RGB values or hex values where we can go ahead and change that watercolor, possibly to match a color of a utility in your project. We have some labeling options as well. So you'll see in a previous menu, I was able to change the name of this and it changed our label. We can also make those edits here under our section label auto menu. First off, we can show whether we want to use the label or not. We can also choose to turn on or off those leader lines. Um, by turning this one off, you'll see those are still there, but that's showing those leader lines from the adjacent lanes. So I can turn those off as well to show you those without. We have a horizontal leader line if you want to link those up across the top. 
We can scale the size of the text to match the width of our section. So you'll see here, this adds a little bit of buffer, but if we were to change this to just lane, there we go. It will adjust the size of that panel. You can change the font. We have a few options there. We can also adjust the text color if you'd like. You can adjust the height of that label. So you can see I'm adjusting this label up and down using that spin bar. You can also move the label forward or backward in our model. A really popular way to label these lanes sometimes is to set your label position to negative one. That brings it all the way to the front and we can change our height down to have that label appear in the subgrade. And again, if you wanna turn those stems off, you can turn off those leader lines. So that's a really nice way to label a typical section as well. We can also uh, adjust the horizontal alignment of our label so we can push this left to right inside the section. We can change the background color of the label. We can also hide units in the label. So if we wanted to turn off units here, there's also a global setting to hide units across all labels. Here it is in the units section of the global settings. You can also override a dimension. So if you needed to show a measurement that is different than what's in the model, you can toggle on the override dimension button and type in your measurement here and press enter. This is really useful for if you are trying to show uh, pedestrians walking in two different directions on a sidewalk. So for instance, if we had six feet of sidewalk, but wanted to show pedestrians moving in both directions, we could show two three foot sidewalks next to each other and play with some of those features of labeling and overrides and turning stems on and off to show a six foot sidewalk that way. So you can see I turned off the labels and stems. I'm gonna use one of these two and move the sidewalk label to the right. And I can override this dimension by toggling that on and pressing six. We also have the ability to change our default label settings. So for any changes you make to one of your sections, for instance, let's show a white background of that label and black text. We can go ahead at the bottom and save this setting as default and then easily apply that default to all the labels in the model. Moving on in our section editor, we have the custom label tool. This is a tool that allows you to place a custom label somewhere in your section model. This is appropriate for one-off labels that uh, would be complementary or supplementary to the labels across the top here. Uh, so after you place the custom label, you can go to the Edit Custom Label tool, and that will allow you to select from the drop-down of place labels. Here you can see I only have one but then I can change things like text and location and rotation of this. Um, so I'll show you a few examples of that. So let's go ahead and label this fire hydrant. Let's say we wanna make this header size a little bit larger. We have this spin bar here. We have the ability to change the font and the font color. You can also place an image. This generally consists of arrows. So this, these are good for if you want to show a pavement slope. Um, we can also control the size of that image in there, but I'll turn, turn that off for this fire hydrant. Can change the label size. That changes the box that the label's contained in, in both the X and Y direction. Can change the label background color here. And we can adjust the transparency of that with this A value. We can change the label offset, which will move it around uh, from its stem in three dimensions. So I'll show you by typing in a few values. When we do an X offset, you can see it pushes that label to the right. If we do a Y offset, it will push it forward. A negative value will push it backward. 
reset that there, and the Z offset will raise or lower it uh, while maintaining that stem uh, location. We can also take an overall label alignment adjustment here from the X or Y direction. Go ahead and push that over a little bit. We can also change the leader line width. So here we have a top width. I can make that 100. We can also adjust the bottom width up from zero. We can also move this label around in 3D space. So we have some slider bars here that we can type in values to basically move that entire label should you have placed it wrong in the first place. So I'll add a couple numbers here to move that back. We can move it to the right. We can also move it up or down. We can also rotate the label in the X or Y direction. And Z will rotate it around the Z axis. There's also at the bottom a total label scale for you to slide that up if you want to make that whole label larger or smaller. At the very bottom of the custom label menu, you can remove the selected label. I'll go ahead and show you one more example where I add a label to our pavement to show a 2% cross slope. And there we go. Now we have a floating 2% cross slope over that lane. Next in our section editing menu is the asset placement tool. This operates similarly to the custom label where we have a placement mode and editing mode. You'll see when I toggle on placement mode, I now get the option in a pull down box to bring in some other elements to this section. So for instance, I can add in a bush here and this would be associated when I place it with this grass four foot wide section here. So I can go ahead and click within that section. I could also click anywhere else in the model, but just know that this element will be tied to this section if I have it activated. So I can go to my editing mode and see those. You'll see this uh, default project already has a fire hydrant here in the grass section here. Uh, but there is a pull down list for those two bushes I just placed. You can see it will highlight which one I have uh, editing control over. So I'm going to go ahead and remove this asset that's way over here on the left with this button at the bottom. And then select my bush over here and show you some of the editing ability. So we can use these slider bars to change the location in the X or Y directions. We can also adjust that up or down with a Z adjustment. And we can also rotate these elements. So based on what you're trying to model, there is a number of applications for this, whether you're trying to place uh, some specific sidewalk squares that don't necessarily stretch the whole section, or maybe putting in a couple signs or just filling out your vegetation. There's a lot of functionality here. There's also a scale factor here for the asset where we can unlock it and adjust the scale uh, disproportionately in the X, Y, or Z direction. We can link that back together to do a proportional scale so we can blow some assets up or shrink them down to size as appropriate for your model. One other thing I'll note is our section hierarchy has a display shortcut to show if one of your sections has a placed asset in it. So what that's going to do is help you go find any of your assets that might have been placed outside your section. So for instance, if this bush was moved all the way to the left, I might think when I come back to this model that that element would be associated with this section over here, and when I go to edit, I see there's nothing there. So that section hierarchy right now is just a shortcut to show you which of your sections in your model have a 3D asset tied to them with that little triangle icon, and that'll help you go into your editing mode to locate those efficiently. You'll notice that our placed assets 
uh, are somewhat limited to start. So you'll see the common lane has a drop down menu with some signs, with some raised pavement markers, uh, maybe some bollards, whereas our grass sections or our trees may have a different set of assets to choose from. Uh, there is customization built into Beyond Typicals where you can adjust uh, how many of our uh, hundreds of 3D assets can be placed there. So let's say you're missing the ability to place a manhole lid in a common lane. I don't see it there. I can go ahead and find that manhole lid and it brings up this customizing asset menu where I can then toggle on all of the different sections and beyond typicals that I want to be able to place that asset. A uh, quick shortcut would be to enable all if you're not sure uh, how many of your different sections you'd be placing that in. Uh, but keep in mind that if you do toggle that on, that that element will then be in all of those drop down lists and maybe you don't want that. So for now, I'm just going to toggle on common lane. And now I'll be able to go find that manhole lid. It's called manhole round three. I can turn placement mode on and go and place it on my common lane. Let's go ahead and start with a clean slate to show you the next two items to customize your sections. These are the addition of pathway arrows to your sections and also area highlights. So you'll see I've got arrows on the left and highlights on the right. You'll see the arrows have plenty of functionality. We can change the colors using the RGB values or the spin bar of colors. We can also adjust the arrow width or the number or frequency of arrows, as well as the arrow texture or type. Let's go ahead and set both of these to green to represent open lanes of traffic, maybe in a maintenance of traffic plan diagram. And on this other side, we can turn off traffic to indicate a construction zone. There we go. So there we can represent uh, some moving lanes and potentially some work zones. Again, this area highlight has a lot of customization as well. So we can change those colors and we can make sure we match those colors using our RGB or hex values. We also have the ability to change the width of the highlight the length of the highlight and its alignment along the section. We also have a few different highlight textures. We have this diagonal stripes, also a woven pattern and a zigzag pattern. And you'll see we can also adjust the scale of these as well. And it's really nice when all the customization matches up across lanes. That looks like a nice consistent highlight down your section. Finally, I'll show you one of the last edits we can make on our sections, that is our texturing. This is a really powerful tool if you're concerned about the type of pavement and subgrade that's being shown and the depths there. So you'll see we've got some presets in our basic texturing. So we've got asphalt with wear. So it has some of that nice cracking and tire rutting for asphalt that might be somewhat old. We have some cleaner, nowhere textures here. So I'll make those changes so you can see those comparatively across the section. So we have our asphalt wear over here and nowhere here. We also have our asphalt fresh texture, which is a nice way to show a newly paved roadway pavement, possibly in a final condition diagram. We also have the ability to make green asphalt. This is useful for bike lanes. It's also a default setting on our bike lanes. We have concrete. Concrete without wear. We have some alternative concretes as well. So feel free to play with these. These are great for showing different pavement types. You'll see these are also useful in uh, outer sections if you're showing, maybe you wanna show a brick sidewalk. So we have some brick patterns here. Um, we have a bunch of different textures here, snow, wood, other types of asphalt. 
We also have the ability to turn a section transparent. So you'll see if we turn transparent on that top layer goes away, which could be useful in like a mill and overlay uh, example section. And then for our pro users, we're able to unlock this advanced texturing section and be able to manipulate the textures below our top surface as well. So you'll see I've got that transparent set here. I can also change the sub base if I wanted to show some extra asphalt layers. I can do that here. We also have the ability to change our uh, layers below that as well. For our pro users, we also have the bridge section customization. So I'll show you what we can do there. I'll bring in a few lanes. Uh, you'll see they don't have the earth subgrade here. So all these elements will just kind of hover, but we also have a substructure menu. So you'll see we can toggle on certain elements and start to build a substructure of these and that we have some pull down options. So right here, I will show a box girder. Maybe I'll put one over here on this one as well. We can also use these scaling and position transforms to size these substructure elements and move them into place. In this substructure menu, we can add other elements. So let's go ahead and add a pier cap and move that into place. And we can toggle on another element and go ahead and show some piers. So a lot of customization here where you can use the substructure menu in each of your bridge components to build out your substructure as well. As I mentioned earlier in this video, we have a lot of sections in Beyond Typicals, so I'll use the rest of this video to give you an overall tour of what we have. I won't pull in everything, but I'll show you the wide array of sections and some of the features that we can customize. So we'll go ahead and start with some lanes and striping. You'll see in our default project, that two-way left turn lane project, that we have some modified striping. So I'll go ahead and show you how to do that. I'll first turn off traffic in this center lane. Then I will add a two-way left turn lane marking and pull those together. Then I can adjust the striping. I'll go to the section hierarchy and select the left stripe of that center lane. I could also use the arrow keys to navigate between those. You can see for striping, I can toggle on double striping, and I can also select a continuous striping side left or right. So we'll use that here. Over on the right, I'll engage double striping and make the right stripe continuous. Then we can change the color of our stripes with this RGB values spin bar. If you want pure yellow, the easiest way is to drag blue all the way to zero. I find that if you want something to look a little more realistic, you can also bring green down to about 0.4 and get something a little more like an orange that's out on the pavement. If your elements don't have stripes around them, you can press S on your keyboard as a shortcut to add striping where there are no stripes next to your elements. You can see those populate here in the section hierarchy. If I wanted to make any of these solid, I can also change the spacing of my stripes and bring that down to zero. I can also expand that out pretty large as well. If I want to change the striping width, we can go between six, eight, and 10 inches. I'll show you that a little closer. See, it gets a little wider. You can also change the length of the stripes. So if you want to combine a closer spacing with those shorter stripes, you can resemble a dotted lane line. We also have a number of other roadway sections. So we have parking lanes, a shared lane, which cycles between cars and bikes. 
And if you want to see bikes more frequently, that's a traffic adjustment you can make. You can, for instance, pull out some of the additional vehicles, leave cyclists on, and you'll see those cyclists come more frequently interspersed with those remaining cars. The speed of our shared lane uh, is preset to 25 miles an hour, but we can bring that down a little bit for something more realistic. But ultimately, that speed's controlling both the bikes and the cars moving through that shared lane. We also have a bus lane, which will only have uh, buses as the uh, vehicles moving through it. We can combine this in a lot of places. We like to see red bus lane pavements, so you can turn that using your texturing. You can turn that asphalt pavement red. If that's too dark, maybe you want to have a red concrete. That red would pop a little bit better. Our parking lane that I brought in here, you'll see it has a primary asset of static vehicles. We can space those out if we choose. So you can see by pulling this spin bar, we can space out the number of and, and proximity of those parked cars. We can move them left or right using this internal offset setting. We also have an external offset setting if you needed for any reason to pull these out further away from the uh, left and right edges of your section. I'll also show a wider parking lane and show that we can uh, rotate these using the primary asset rotation spin bar. So if I want to rotate these in the Z direction, you can see we can get something like angled parking. We have plenty of other customization too, which you probably wouldn't need to use, like a vertical offset or being able to rotate these cars in other directions. So just be sure you're using the uh, customization that works best for you. Again, we have a uh, randomization button. So if you wanted to see a different mix of those parked cars, we have that ability here too. And then as in most of our sections, we do have the secondary asset uh, drop-down box. So if you did want to add a second repeating asset within a section, you have that ability. So for instance, we could show something like a handicap parking sign. And let's move those cars a little bit to the left. We can take this sign and rotate it using our Z rotation. So you can see those. And we can move these with our horizontal offsets and longitudinal offsets. I'll show you some of the remaining in-road elements. So I'll bring in a couple common lanes for context. See we have a flat median, which is just a concrete covered flat median at the same elevation as a common lane. We've also got a shoulder, which is asphalt by default can also adjust the widths of these. We've also got a list of primary assets that might be more appropriate for a shoulder. We've also got a bike lane here. You can see it's by default this green covered asphalt and the traffic moving through it are cyclists. And then finally, we've got a rumble strip that we can show some nice texture to when we get up close. We have um, curb and gutter. We've been teaching our users that if they want to use curb and gutter and they're being uh, very specific about their widths, then they should pull in these elements separately. So we have those two at the top of the list. Uh, the reason for that being is if you were to use our curb and gutter combined element, that when you change the width on this, you'll see that both the gutter pan and the curb width will scale proportionally. Um, so if you wanted to be specific about a specific gutter width, let's say you want a two foot gutter width and a six inch curb width, you could make those specific adjustments separately to those elements. Down here, we have quite a few different curb types. So go ahead and bring in one, two, three, or five. So when you get real close, if your project calls for this level of specificity, you can see each of these curbs have a little bit different face uh, profile to them. So we have some different options there. We also have a couple different curbs and gutters. So we have a generic curb and gutter one, one B and two. Again, these scale 
proportionally to the total width of the curb and gutter. So if you're maybe in more of a planning level and you just kind of know the total width of the curb and gutter combined, these can be a lot quicker to use than uh, the separate curbs and gutters. We also have some ditches. So we've got a couple of V-ditch options. We also have a water channel and a stream. So you can see those latter two have a water element in them. We also have the ability, which I can show you later, to add in our own water planes. So we do have an element that you can bring in a water and move it around in your section. Again, these ditches are customizable for texturing. So if you didn't want to see a paved ditch, you could change that to one of our grass or other options. We have six different kinds of trenches in Beyond Typicals. These are great for showing utility improvements. You'll see as I bring these in, we have some options, uh, some rectangular, some with more of a uh, sloped sides. We have covered and uncovered options as well as an option with shoring. We can use the underground menu to add in pipes. So when we toggle that on, you'll see we've added a 24 inch pipe that we can move internal to that trench. Also show you, you can play with the textures. So for our basic and light users, we can only change the top texture of that pavement. So you'll see we can make a concrete roadway pavement next to that trench. Otherwise our pro users, we can unlock and adjust the color of the metal covering, or we can adjust the uh, different layers of earth next to that as well. You'll notice that as you scale the width of your section, all of those elements also scale proportionally. So as your trench gets bigger, keep in mind that your sides and your slopes will start to change in scale as well. We have a few different options for walkways in Beyond Typicals, the most common of which would be our sidewalk section, which you can see when inserted by default sits at the top elevation of our curb and gutter. So at a height of zero, it is aligning six inches higher than our roadway pavement. We also have a bus stop, which is a large sidewalk section where the primary asset is a bus stop shelter. You can see that here. That shelter can be moved left or right with the internal horizontal offset, forward or back, and the longitudinal offset are scaled. A couple other walkway options include a winding path and a jogging path. So see these two options have a jogging pedestrian with a speed that's a little higher than the walking speed of three miles an hour. You could adjust that on your sidewalk. There is a primary asset option where you can change that to a jogging pedestrian and increase the speed to match. Likewise, you could do the same on a jogging path is reduce the speed and change the pedestrian to walking. Keep in mind that when you adjust the width on these paths, the winding path and straight path, that the width of the path and this shoulder that's built in will scale proportionally as well. So I recommend if you want to be specific about your widths that you could use a sidewalk and perhaps a flat slope next to it to indicate specific widths. In the traffic menu, you can also adjust the volume of pedestrians on your sidewalk. So you can pull the slider bar to increase the frequency in which pedestrians will populate and walk through your section. In the global traffic settings, you have the ability to adjust the pedestrian traffic that's walking through your corridor. We have a couple spin bars to adjust a distribution for genders where you can go to more women or more men as they spawn and move through the model. And you can also adjust the ethnicities in the same way, perhaps to match a specific demographic of where your project is located. We have a few preset options for vegetation in Beyond Typicals. At the top here, we have a raised median. So you'll see that is an eight foot wide planted median 
with a grass texture as well as three-dimensional grass and beech trees as repeating assets. Similar to sidewalk, the top edge of this raised median section aligns with the top of curbs, so six inches higher than the roadway pavement. We have a number of other 3D grasses. I'll note that when we bring in a lot of grasses to a model, particularly this rye grass here, there's a lot of polygons built into those three dimensional elements. So use sparingly if you start to get a frame rate that ends up being pretty choppy. This 3D grass will adjust dynamically in width. So you'll see if I change the scale, that 3D grass will scale with it. So a word of warning, if you start to make these sections really wide, that scale could start to look unrealistic and you may want to bring in multiple sections of grass. We also have a trees and a desert section. You'll see by default these are a little bit wider sections and we also have a repeating asset but has some left right randomization of the placement through that section. That's because we've got this uniform box toggled off next to internal horizontal offset. If we toggle that back on, you'll see those assets that repeat will fall in a straight line and we can move those left right. But with that toggled off and increasing and decreasing that horizontal offset, we'll get more of a left right orientation or more of a center line orientation based on that offset scale. We can also enable a randomization of those assets themselves. So we can change a range of minimum and maximum rotations for those elements, as well as an additional scale. So if you want to add in some height differential between those assets, you can add a higher scale. If they do get too big, you might want to consider bumping down the total scale of that asset. Then you can click this button at the bottom to re-randomize your assets that will now have randomization with horizontal offset, scale, and rotation. You can also add a secondary asset to these sections. So here I'll add some rocks to this desert section. You'll see I can adjust the spacing on those, the internal horizontal offset, and the rotation and scaling randomization as well. We also have a fence section. You'll see we have in the primary asset a pull down where we can adjust the type of fence between a number of different options. Got some chain link and some picket and other wood fences. We can adjust the width of that section down to a foot. We can also adjust the texture in case we want it on a different material. We have some buildings, so we have a, two sections, a building small and a building large. You'll see the building small has, uh, by preset, some of these commercial buildings. Um, those are shown as a pull-down in the primary asset. We have some other options too. If you want to go with some smaller generic buildings, we have some white boxes. We also have some multifamily residential buildings, and I'll go ahead and click randomize so you can see some of the differences there. We also have some single family buildings. You'll see the backs of these have a garage door. I'll go ahead and rotate these 180 degrees and you'll see the front has more of a front porch, front door appearance. We also have large buildings. You'll see by default that it is a 100 foot wide pad with a very large generic building on it that we can randomize to get different heights. We can also use our asset modification tools to do things like scale those or just scale in the Z direction if you're going for a specific height. We also have some other buildings uh, attached to this building's large section. I'm first going to lengthen our section so you can see some of the differences between those. So we have a few different types of urban buildings. You'll see they don't necessarily fit perfectly within the 100 foot wide section and aren't necessarily spaced to repeat but we do have this wide array of buildings that you can use um, and either space them out or scale them as you need to to fit your section. If these aren't working for you as a repeated asset, you can always turn them off in the primary asset 
and go to our asset placement tool and those same buildings will be there to place individually within the section. And you can use the asset editing tools to go ahead and select those and make any changes like location or rotation or scale. We do like to keep the number of buildings in Beyond Typicals to a minimum that will serve most of our users because the more we add to the file, the larger the download will be. If you have a 3D asset, we do have the ability to import those. So if you have an FBX or an OBJ file, we do have this uh, imported assets tool in beta currently where we can go ahead and import 3D objects. So see, I've got this town hall building. I can go ahead and make that uh, droppable in the building's large section. There it is. And you'll see that sometimes when you import these assets, you will need to rotate them, scale them, and move them around to fit your model. We've got a number of rail options. At the top here, we have a light rail section. You'll see it kind of looks like a streetcar with the rails embedded in the pavement. We've also got a tram which is very similar, but moves a little bit slower. We also have a raised rail option, a high-speed commuter rail with cross ties on a gravel base, a freight train option. These look a lot better when you lengthen your section out, so you can see the whole length of those trains. You can also adjust the speed of these trains similar to other traffic moving through your model. Beyond Typicals has a large number of cut and fill slopes. What that does is allow our user to specify a certain uh, slope, uh, rise and run of our sections. Uh, the naming convention here, how we have a number after the word slope, is the height in which the section changes across that slope. So while we know we have a variable width, we can't uh, have, provide a static slope across that section. But to our users, knowing that this rise is one foot, we can create our custom slopes by using some basic math. So we have a 1 to 20 here, a 1 to 50. So by changing the slope and knowing the height differential across that, we're able to customize our slopes. Uh, another example here would be a cut slope 3. So if we wanted a 4 to 1, we could make that 12 feet wide, knowing that we are uh, dropping 3 feet over 12 feet. Our fill slopes operate the same way. So we have a fill slope. I will flip that so we can change this as well to get a one to four side slope in a fill section as well. Our cut slopes go quite large. They go larger than the sections can even be raised, but that can add context if you're along a steep slope with your section. We also have some cut slopes with ballast. I'll bring in a couple of those sections along with some common lanes so you can see how those can look nice in more of a rural setting without curb and gutter. So this slope brings in kind of a tapered end to your asphalt and tapers your subgrade out. We can also play with some of those textures over here. You see we can change the top texture which will change the pavement that's shown there. And then our advanced texturing allows changes of these uh, subgrades for our pro users. We have a number of retaining walls as well. So I can bring in a couple of those. These were provided by Zane Pratt from David Evans and Associates. You can see with that icon down here. Uh, so thank you and shout out to Zane for providing these to Beyond Typicals. Um, we do have the ability to bring in a variety of these that are preset. We also have, which I can show you in a minute, a custom retaining wall creator or a simple retaining wall preset that has some other options here. You'll see these elements here do have a width. So our, our wall section is eight feet wide. And if we tug on that spin bar, we can change the width of those and that all those elements are scaling proportionally to the width.
Uh, so that may be a bit prohibitive for some users or maybe the fill slope or pavement component of this uh, isn't quite accurate for your project, hence the retaining wall custom creator. But if you're looking for something quick and simple, these are really helpful as well. We can even change the texture on this. So this uh, concrete retaining wall, we can go ahead and pull down and find something that might look more applicable to your project. We've also got a sound wall here. I'll go ahead and flip that so you can see it. So again, that has a width built into it, kind of a sidewalk element next to it. And this sound wall has a couple of different options when we change our primary asset. You can also shift that sound wall within the section using the horizontal offset spin bar. As we get closer to the bottom of the list, we have this waterfront section. See, this is nice for waterfront features uh, with a wall built into it and a fence along the top. That fence can be turned off by switching the primary asset to none. I'll show you the last couple of retaining wall options. Down here at the bottom of our sections menu, we have a retaining wall preset option. So you see we can bring that into our model. It has zero feet of width, so the element sits over the top of the adjacent sections and subgrade. We can boost that height up or down. And we also have this retaining walls editing menu, which is, operates similar to the underground pipe menu, where we can toggle on and off elements. And here in this retaining wall preset, those elements are a list of preset retaining wall options that you can then further adjust the scale of up or down, left or right. You can also change the rotation if you need to do that in your model. You can also use the inner and outer positioning to move those elements uh, left or right in your model away from that section if you need to. So those are a number of presets. If you need something a little bit more specific or customized to your model, we have this retaining wall custom option, which is very similar to the preset in that it has zero feet of width and can be adjusted up or down. But in that retaining wall menu, you'll see we now have three different elements toggled on. So for this retaining wall preset, there is a footer toggled on, a stem toggled on, and a barrier rail toggled on. Between those three different elements, we can change the size of those. So there is a pull down for that where you'll see we have a bunch of different options for footer dimensions. So as little as three feet by eight inches to 12 feet by 18. And if you wanted to do the math and needed to scale those up or down, you can do that as well. Our stem has a similar list of options to choose from. So we have a stem that's 12 foot by 18 inches wide. We can shrink that up to four feet by 12 inches or go as high as 14 by 18. Again, if you need to scale those, if you know you have a wider wall, you can go ahead and adjust the X scale of those elements. And then our third option is this barrier rail where we've got a few different options here for the top of the wall. Alternatively, if you want to show a key, you can add that as well with this third element. So that key has dropped down. I'll drop the Y position a little bit more so you can see that. And we can move that X position over to add a key to the bottom of the wall. So that'll do it for part three of the Beyond Typicals video tutorial series, where hopefully you've learned how to place, move, and edit our basic roadway section elements. In the next video, I'll do a deeper dive on some of the more advanced section types and customization features available in Beyond Typicals. I'll also give a tour of our bridge sections available to our pro users.